Sir. Okay, I, I, this question may apply to more than just Jay, but let me direct it to him. Um, you mentioned the seeds at the top. That, that would be linseed. Correct. And so there's another valuable product sitting at the top of the plant. Is, is your, uh, is reaping uh, flax for fiber consistent with getting the seeds? It is, it is consistent, um, you know, and that's where, that's where like a real agronomic, I think, deep dive needs to be taken. Um, the, the seed, the answer is yes. You can harvest the seed and you can use it for, and it's edible as well. So you can use it for food, you can use it for vitamins, you can use it for linseed and like all of the industrial applications. Um, the, the plant that, they currently, that is currently used for linseed production is a very short plant. Um, and it, it, it's very bushy, it like kind of sprawls out. Um, fiber flax um, has been, you know, you plant it very closely to itself and then it grows very, very, very tall and then you got the seeds at the top. So there, is, there are ways to go through and actually take, take the seed off the top of the plant and then actually knock the plant down and let it start to ret naturally on the, um, on the field. So yes, that is, that is a possibility. Thanks. And a, a, a brief reminder that the, one, of the, one of the things that we were trying to achieve by sort of collective question period is to ask the question that you think everybody, other, other, everybody else has on their mind. Uh, the reason is to, to do, to do some, some saving of time sort of within the thing. Pick up Robert and then. Uh, yeah, uh, great presentations, everybody. Um, I was wondering if, and this, I think some of you guys address this in different ways, but I'm interested for most of you. Uh, how you guys are envisioning scale and what scale looks like for you, um, and then sort of what the implications of that are. So at what point do you think, Jay, you'll get down to cost? And mm -hmm. for Eileen Fisher, you know, is it, how does it go beyond the Bronx? And um, where, what will that look like and when? You start, Kenneth. You start. Uh, OK. So uh, we are seeing the Bronx as a, as a pilot. Um, it's hard for me to gauge the time. I think part of it is also around the fiber innovation piece, how long it takes us to get that fiber right, and, and whether creating that entire values chain is dependent on getting that the timing of that fiber right. But we do see it, see it scalable globally. So um, I'm going to guess something like three to five years for Blue Flower to be in a place where it's um, at, a, at a state where we could begin um, creating models of it or, or scaling it other places in the world. I, I also think we're going to be able to learn things from it. It's, it's conceived at a local scale, but I think that there will be actually really important lessons we're going to be able to take from it and imply at a larger industrial scale in bigger supply chains. And uh, from our scaling standpoint, we will we do, we do need to make a few investments um, in some of our facilities right now. We do know that you know, a, basically a, a contained footprint is obviously the most efficient um, and not kind of moving around to different facilities. Um, so as we, we are in production and we know that we are achieving this and um, we could actually start getting that down um, very quickly even within the year. Was your question for all, for everybody? So if we just go down the line. Um, so uh, I mentioned in the presentation that we're building our second facility in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, in partnership with Steel Air. It's really exciting because uh, we've designed and developed this equipment package, essentially a turnkey mushroom material factory. And, and this is geared towards packaging, but it's uh, pretty simple to, to tweak it for other products. Um, and so we're just at the cusp of being able to really scale rapidly and, and replicate the system anywhere. Um, We've been working with the USDA uh, to qualify different agricultural byproducts from not only all over the country, but all over the world. Uh, so we've got some blends that are you know, close to being fine-tuned that are ready for, for other regions. Um, and, uh, and a big question for us that I'm hoping this group can help answer is um, how do we move into Asia? Because uh, a lot of our customers are, are saying, you know, we would buy loads of this stuff, but all of our products are packaged in, in uh, Southeast Asia. And, uh, and that's new for us, so we'd love to learn more. Um, <clears throat> I guess that's a slightly different issue for me, but the whole vision behind building a platform is 
to precisely um, scale material innovation around these kinds of living materials. Um, so, you know, the ambition for this has to be a vast global community in one place, learning from one another. And I guess that, similar to what Ron is, has achieved so far with his, is millions of people from every kind of background. So academic labs and designers and individuals coming together um, as one community. Um, we do actively work with 200 farmers, selling some thousands meters per year. And now, um, there are, everybody in Uganda is a farmer and in the neighboring countries as well. So it's easy to scale up um, since the, the trees grow, grow very quick. So it's um, a matter of doing it and having the market and uh, then it can grow to, let's say, hundreds of thousands of meters per year. Uh, it's still a niche product maybe in a way, but um, yeah, it makes a big impact in, in these countries. Thanks, Oliver. Bill? Yeah, this is uh, for Sam. Um, first of all, I love what you're doing. Uh, love, love the name. And people with dyslexia will see it as evocative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, spell check. <laughs> <laughs> it, happens, it happens a lot in the media. And um, I'm wondering what, if you can talk a little bit more about your licensing uh, relationship with the sealed air uh, and how you've been able to capture hard IP and perhaps soft IP, structure that. And what advice would you give to uh, Mary, Oliver, and Jay and how they could do a similar type of approach and get to scale by uh, applying the same types of process to different, uh, different uh, feedstock? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so Sealed Air made sense to us as a licensing partner uh, within North America, and the license was extended to Europe because uh, they're really dominant. They're the number one in protective packaging. Uh, they're famous for bubble wrap. They do all sorts of things, but they didn't have uh, a molded foam. And so they were exploring getting into that. Um, the CEOs of both companies met at the World Economic Forum. We were a tech pioneer a few years ago. Uh, so that was a really unique opportunity um, to make that connection. Um, and it took a year to get the licensing agreement hashed out, but it's been really fantastic. Um, really, really uh, exciting to go through the tech transfer and see this other company with, you know, a prototyping lab growing their own mushroom materials that we taught them how to grow. Uh, and now bringing this factory online is, is really great. So, um, you know, I think it uh, is very IP dependent. We've got a really uh, great patent portfolio. We've uh, filed in 35 countries. Uh, some, are, some are issued, some are still pending. Um, and it's a pretty broad, um, broad space because nothing is, not, not much has been done with materials and fungi. It's really uh, very novel. Um, but I don't, I don't know for uh, for bark text, I don't think the IP is necessary. I think that um, that just the the story and their experience is really what does it. They're, they're the world's experts in you know transferring this. Um, and I think for for some applications, licensing uh, maybe could make sense. Um, but yeah, I don't know. We'll talk more. Connie. Um, yesterday when we were going through the impact rotations, a lot of what we did was go through a specific journey and a lot of the entrepreneurs or the innovators talked about, you know, an unexpected turn that they took just through the impact rotations. And I'm curious if each one of you can very briefly give an example up until this point with your product or your innovation, sort of an unexpected turn that you weren't anticipating, but that actually turned out for the better, whether it's a, a partnership or your marketing strategy or whatever it was, even in your product, um, you know, development. I'll take a stab at that. Um, our biggest turn uh, actually just happened two months ago when we almost overnight decided that we wanted to deeply work with the um, some really smart folks in the linen industry uh, in Europe, which is where our acquisition of the of the facilities are coming from it's um you know it it i have to say it almost happened overnight and it's been a really big it's been a really big motivator for us as a team and it's also like opened up opportunities that have we never expected so it would it really it really was a big positive step in the right direction for us 
Our, our main market is yet uh, in interior works and decoration, and it is mainly um, customized products. So uh, we aim for finding more applications in, well, in serial products. We have, there are some customers doing lampshades, for instance. Um, um, uh, I mean, usually it's, it's a project where either we, we have a hotel who wants to have it, or we, do, we don't have that. So we want to overcome that. And uh, a new example is now, um, um, it has good acoustic properties as well, and there is not much in the market uh, with natural materials. And um, uh, on January will be uh, launched uh, acoustic panels with bark tags. And uh, so it has all these unique um, features still, but it's a serial product. And um, we do this with a Swiss partner, and it will be launched on International Furniture Fair in Cologne next year. So that's a good example. We aim to find more uh, partnerships, um, customers, uh, well, to go, to go into these, these things. Yes, and I'll also add that uh, we need, uh, like in research, for example, because back cloth, back text uh, still has a, a great potential, which we could still explore further, because everyone who has it in the hands always has an idea. So I think in the area of research, we might need some help still. Um, <clears throat> well, for me, the journey has been massive already. The, the flip from coming in my proposal initially to launch, being focused around one particular uh, fermentation method to produce a cellulose material to instead of thinking about being one product focused material company thinking about the need for someone to really lead a movement around m living materials and innovation um, so already this is a very recent journey for me but that was a major pivot the first couple of years of Ecovative we were really focused primarily on uh, building insulation and we realized that starting from you know, a few guys in the basement of the RPI business incubator, uh, taking on these huge commodity uh, companies was pretty daunting. Um, and there's also a lot of regulation, code compliance, and we realized packaging had much lower barriers to entry. And by molding this into shape, you get a, a higher value per cubic volume. Uh, and so there, for a lot of reasons, we were able to sort of pivot and adapt what we were doing and focus just on packaging for a few years. And now that packaging is, is starting to take off, uh, we're sort of at this stage where we're going in, you know, 50 different directions, and we've got to sort of reel it in and, and pick a focus. So I ran into Otto Scharmer, who some of you may know. He leads MIT's Presencing Institute at an airport. Um, our planes were delayed, and he said to me, you know, Eileen Fisher really ought to create a local supply chain. And I said, well, funny you should say that. And uh, we had just been developing this idea, and um, I had pictures in my uh, office at home, all these post-its. We were sort of figuring out what the system was. So I had all these post-its up on the wall with all, and all the different pedals. So I walked him through it, and he's like, it's, it's the future. <laughs> And what can I do? How can we help you? He connected us to MIT CoLab's uh, Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative. Um, we had also just met Michael Peck, who's Mondragon's uh, US agent. And uh, Amy and I actually were taking a trip to Europe. We met Michael Peck and the MIT CoLab guy in Bilbao, Spain, sat down and had a breakfast. BCDI was very excited, really wanted to bring Eileen Fisher in as a partner. So very quickly, what was uh, an idea uh, became real, people attracted to it who wanted to come into it and um, help, help us make it into a concrete reality. And just to give, put that into context, the idea was birthed at the uh, launch summit, is that what it's called, in April? Really birthed after that, the inspiration came, we submitted the proposal in what, June? Mm -hmm. That's when we had the idea together. And it, all of the development, all the partnerships that have emerged for us have happened over the summer. And five months ago, we had no idea that this was going to be on our plates now. And this is, this is something that we've really seen a little bit happen. But what we're trying to sort of look more intentional is what, what can be born with this group of people? What can be born at lunch? You know, this community that's actually over there. Um, and I think that this is, this is one of those examples of how it is.